be introduced to the stage Haile Opua Baker to introduce Amy Choi. Awesome, awesome. Mahalo a Andrea, Lily, and Roger. Um, so I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Sammy Choi has educational community and professional experience as an actor, director, and teacher, as well as her BFA, MFA, and PhD in theater. Her dissertation, Staging Identity, the Intercultural Theater of Hawaii, was a deeper dive uh, into the complexities of, of culture identity um, as expressed by particular playwrights here in Hawaii. And it really built off of um, previous studies by Dr. Dennis Carroll, um, as well as um, Dr. Yustana Matos, who I saw in the house yesterday. Aloha if you're here. Um, and it tends to be a seminal work that we're able to utilize in the classroom to help students understand the differences between the categorizing different types of plays and what's being expressed in those plays beyond just the concept of Asian American. Right, looking at local Asian, local Hawaiian, um, and different aspects of identity. And I'm not going to do much more than that because I will let the we will let our keynote <laughs> speak to that. But I'm a real big proponent of the work, and it's read every time I teach um, our drama and theater of Hawaii course here at Manoa. After working as a, an actor in the San Francisco Bay Area, Sammy returned to Hawaii. Since then, in addition to teaching theater and acting at Kapi'olani Community College and here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, she has been a co-director, co-producer for public radio shows, Aloha Shorts, and director-producer for the Hawaii Pono'i Coalition. With Hawaii Pono'i Coalition, she has directed living history plays by Victoria Nalani Nubo, the most recent being Kekawa Okalahui, the life of Prince Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole Pi'ikoi. It is my privilege to bring forward our keynote for today Dr. Sammy Choi. Okay. So I, um, <laughs> I asked for some elevation, but I think. <laughs> I think I'm a bit too tall now, so bear with me here. All right, you're just going to have to live with a talking head. That's all there is to it. So, aloha mai kako. I am honored to be here at Confest 2024 to Kata, Hailea Poor Baker, to Leilani, Mahalo Yalko for the invitation to give this keynote address. Uh, it's been in the works for four years now, so I guess it's about time. I used to give a lecture here in Kennedy Theater on um, theater in Hawaii for a large undergraduate theater survey class. I spoke about the community theaters here, about the Asian theater at UH, about the history of Western theater in Hawaii, and about the then nascent Hawaiian theater. Now that was all relatively straightforward. Then, to preface speaking about local theater, I would ask for a show of hands. Are you local if you were born here? Hands up. <laughs> 
okay? Are you local if you have Asian descent? Some hands up. Are you local if your great or great great grandparents worked on a plantation? Hands up. Are you local if you went to high school here? Thinking about it. Are you local if you're Haole? Really thinking about it. Are you local if you're Hawaiian? Responses to that and to all the other questions depended on who the students were and their relationship to Hawaii. And there was never complete agreement. The question about what local is and how to characterize local theater, they don't have simple answers. I think that's why I'm here, to talk about theater, how theater in Hawaii is perceived from the inside. Additionally, I challenge the inclusion of most plays of Hawaii under the AAPI rubric, and I suggest that Hawaii theater can be loosely divided into two types, Hawaiian, local, and then a distant third, Asian American. The usage of AAPI as applied to Hawaii's people as a whole is, at the best, an uneasy fit, and this is equally true when we regard Hawaii's theater. The theme of this conference, Ku'uaina, Ku'upiko, Ku'ukahua, reconnecting and building, rebuilding. Yesterday we had some truly eloquent reflections on what those words mean. I would add a question about ku, it means my, and it's the singular my, and it's usually used when something or someone is held very dear. So, my beloved land, my cherished connections. Pico can mean the umbilical cord or uh, the place where a plant or a stem is attached to a plant, and my precious foundation. Again, quest I have questions about reconnecting. Is that one aisle, is it back to my generation, my, my forebears? If I am reconnecting to other people, then is it a reconnecting or is it a initial connecting? Rebuilding for myself, for a group, Mine, uh, mine are superficial translations of Hawaiian, but I still, remember, I still wonder about the ku'u. So deconstructing this title makes me wonder about positions of enunciation. The who and what of this and the how, it's all about identity. In the context of Hawaii theater, I think it's necessary to examine how folks are representing themselves and how their work reflects their social imaginary. Native Hawaiians, indigenous inhabitants of the island, and descendants of Asian immigrants are not. Recent scholarship has positioned the second group as Asian settler colonial, as complicit with the white colonial dominant culture in its prejudicial treatment of Nakanaka Maoli. However recent the theorizing, this complicity can be traced to the early territorial period and an acceleration after World War II. So, so we have a clear binary and adamantly binary positioning. We have Hawaiians and we have Asian Americans. But in Hawaii, I would suggest there exists a unique self-positioning. How do we count for the local, a status that Hawaiians can claim, although locals cannot claim to participate in the Hawaiian? Let me say here that I am completely aware that nomenclature and identity are highly fluid. They can and they may change constantly. Pronouns, labels, alliances, we choose our pronouns. We name ourselves. And many times this is a positive and powerful thing. Asian American has been a unifying label since 1968. And a way for Americans of Asian descent to ally politically and a way for the US to easily recognize a category that asserts membership in the U.S. while valorizing its immigrant past. So we stand on shifting ground. However, there is a famous Alela Noel, a proverb, which provides a context for balance in the face of constant change. 
it says, Ikavama mua, Ikavama hope. The future is found in the past. I don't claim Hawaiian knowledge for locals or Asian Americans, but I do believe that there is both wisdom and warning in how Hawaii developed its social imaginary, and it behooves us to interrogate and respect that history. But back to nomenclature for a moment. Asian American Pacific Islander, AAPI, I find that so odd, and I have a hard time wrapping my brain around it. For one thing, AAPI is an extremely congested term. Not only are there all the people of Asian descent, East, South, Southeast, Central, when you add in the Pacific Islands, you have Polynesia, Melanesia, and Micronesia, and within those categories are Hawaii, Aotearoa, Samoa, American Samoa, the Cook Islands, Tahiti, New Caledonia, Fiji, Kiribati, Guam, the Northern Marianas, Federated States of Micronesia, and more. And further complicating this is that a number of these are col colonies and territories of other countries. Lumping all these together, descendants of Asian immigrants from a vast part of the globe with indigenous peoples from another vast part of the globe. Even the US Census has disaggregated data about Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders from Asian Americans. And that brings me to the question of how one should refer to the people in Hawaii. Now, we clearly can't all be called Hawaiians. That's reserved for the indigenous residents of these islands. But Asian American? I refer you to a 1994 article called Why There Are No Asian Americans in Hawaii, The Continuing Significance of Local Identity. Jonathan Okamura, Emeritus Professor of Ethnic Studies at UH Manoa, was referring to the identity called local being used as a unifying label rather than Asian American. The article points up the intrinsic differences between the residents of Asian descent in Hawaii and those on the continental United States. He indicates the local as Hawaii's pan-ethnic self-identity. And one way this understanding of pan-ethnicity varies from the Asian American model is that local is not solely Asian. How oh, humans want to name things. We do. Here are some of the designations I've heard. Local Asian. Local Asian American. Hawaiian American, local Haole, yeah. local Japanese, yeah. But a few of those are pretty cringy. There has been a shift in the 30 years since Okamura wrote that. He notes that the class dimension of local identity, though not the racial, has declined in relevance. Even upper middle class individuals can be considered and consider themselves as local. But I don't think the shift has been towards the Asian American. Certainly Hawaii residents have experienced the same political and cultural events as the rest of the country, especially here the effects of globalization and tourism. But none of these have recast locals as Asian Americans, at least not to local people. I know the word local has such a different connotation here. In the continent, for instance, I remember hearing local radio stations fading in and out while driving across country on the continent, or drinking local with friends in, in Asheville or Seattle. In these examples, local is geographic, but local is a specific and assertive culture in Hawaii that supersedes the merely geographic. <clears throat> this cultural identification started with the sugar and pineapple plantations on which various waves of em immigrants and native Hawaiians worked side by side. People of color as laborers and haole or white and haole approved immigrants as owners and overseers. The haole oligarchy, a blending of merchants and missionary descendants, a attempted to segregate the different ethnicities, an effort that was mostly unsuccessful. Scholars have pointed to a particular 20th century event that coalesced the local, both to itself 
and in the eyes of others. This was Nasi Kahahavai, a 1930s murder case that they contend was the historical moment that marked the community-wide acknowledgement of a local identity. As with any social construct, local identity has changed over the years, but in 1931 and 32, this case gave Native Hawaiians, immigrants, and other people of color, particularly the working class, a commonality of concerns that underscored the vast divide between whites and non-whites in Hawaii. In his book, Local Story, The Masi Kahahawai Case and the Culture of History, John Rosa says that because of its outcomes, the Massey case could now serve as an origin story for local identity, an example, as an example of injustice against working class peoples in the islands. For those who don't know the story, in September of 1931, five local working class men were accused of raping Thalia Massey, the hollow wife of a US Navy lieutenant. The men were Joseph Kahahawai, Benny Ahakuelo, Horace Ida, David Takai, and Henry Chang. Massey told police that she'd been raped by some Hawaiian boys. The young men were Hawaiian Japanese and Hawaiian Chinese. The men were put on trial, but a mistrial was declared. Subsequently, Horace Ida was kidnapped by some Navy men, beaten, and threatened with death if he didn't confess. He escaped, but Joseph Kahahawai was later kidnapped by Massey's mother and husband, along with two enlisted men. He was murdered, shot, just up the road in Manoa, not a mile away from where we sit. The four kidnappers were arrested, put on trial, convicted, even with Clarence Darrow as their defense attorney, and then had their sentence commuted to one hour spent in the territorial governor's office drinking champagne. Hawaii's Haole elite of the time presented a unified front against the non-white population of all classes. National and international news followed this case, and the coverage was overwhelmingly negative about the island's general lawlessness and the horror of native brutes ravishing white women. So that was the start of the local, non-race-based, consisting predominantly, though not solely, of people of color, either indigenous or descended from the Asian immigrants who worked the plantations and those who arrived later. And it's still a significant self-identification for many people in the islands. And that local is reflected in Hawaii's theater. Lee Catalunas, Folks You Meet in Longs, a series of monologues by local people in Longs Drugstore, epitomizes local theater. This is not Hawaiian theater by virtue of being about people in Hawaii or because Cataluna is an ethnically Hawaiian playwright. The characters' names play with ethnicity, Hawaiian, Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, but ethnicity is really rarely the focus of the pieces. Catalina is mainly having fun with her characters, lovingly spoofing the absurdities of daily life here. The play contains numerous allusions to place and to common activities in Hawaii. The local audience recognizes both the locations and the plausibility of the actions she describes. Kurt Lum gets some bad lemon chicken in Kailua and barely makes it over the pali to Kalihi. Tommy Pinto complains about having to go to every longs to buy enough coffee filters so his mother can make kahili for his nephew's church play. And Long's cashier, Nadine Tamsing, talks about the nice old man who brings pikake to the girls at the cash registers. If he doesn't have pikake, then he can put the plumeria on toothpick. And then there's playwright Ed Sakamoto, probably the best known on the continent of the local Hawaii playwrights. He wrote the Kamiya Family Trilogy about a local Japanese family, first living in Kona on Hawaii Island, and then in Honolulu. Another of his plays, Our Hearts Were Touched With Fire, Asian American, is about World War II's Al Nisei 110th Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In Aloha, Las Vegas, though, an elderly local man considers leaving Hawaii for Las Vegas, a path many local people have followed. Another Sakamoto piece, Dead of Night, 
is a thriller about labor and unionization struggles in 1950s Honolulu. Definitely a local story. A play dealing with immigrants in Hawaii is Rice Paper Airplane from Gary Park's novel, a story of a Korean man who emigrated to Hawaii in the 1920s. This play has a foot in both Asian America and the local. The unresolved nostalgia of the immigrant who can never return home permeates some law's life and is reinforced by the, the little, literal separation that continues to divide North and South Korea. Some law was originally from Korea's North. However, the material conditions of his immigration are very specific to Hawaii, sugar and pineapple plantation labor, and necessarily involves the other ethnic groups who were also in Hawaii as laborers. These particular circumstances with their attendant historical ramifications, labor strikes, pan-ethnic bonding, second generation assimilation, and self-identification as other than one's ethnic group describe both discreetly and overtly the story's necessary sighting in Hawaii, touches on the Asian American, and moves it into the realm of the local. Hawaiian theater, staged mo'olelo, mo'olelo has many meanings, story, history, myth, chronicle, to name a few, is a relatively recent development, though there have been plays about Hawaiians before, just not so many written by Hawaiians. Hawaiian plays can take place pre or post contact. They sometimes include traditional practices such as oli, mele, hula, Hawaiian herbal medicine, some notable plays address the destructive consequences of colonization. Hawaiian theater is generally not a theater that desires either confirmation from or inclusion in the US. Hawaiians have a complex history with a particular cosmology and culture that originated and developed outside of Western influence. Hawaiian, Hawaiian theater is situated at any time or place in their history with the emphasis on their history. In these plays, language usage varies. In Haile's Hanakeaka, texts are almost exclusively in Hawaiian. In other works, Pidgin or HCE, Hawaiian Creole English, or Standard English are also used. In Hawaii plays, code switching is common, but the choice to do so isn't casual. Rather, the choices of when and how to speak are hyper-aware. Identity can be substantiated by what language is used and by who uses it. In Kupua by Haile Apua Baker, the characters speak in a form of HCE, not standard English, with Hawaiian also used. The two plays are based on pre-contact Hawaiian teaching stories about encounters with shapeshifters, sea cucumbers, and a caterpillar who may appear sometimes completely human and may have sexual relations with human female partners. In each case, the young female's behavior is corrected by a parent who can malama them, who can take care, tend, care for, and protect them when something occurs that their children are too young and inexperienced to handle. Another Hawaiian play, Kamau, is the first part of a trilogy by Eleni Apio, Come out means to keep on, to continue, to persevere, to last. This trilogy will be revived at Kumukuhua Theater next month. As in Kupua, the characters have an intense connection to their physical environment. The story follows three men, two brothers and their cousin, who are existing and trying to thrive in present day Hawaii. The play begins and ends with aloha that not terribly exaggerated version of the greeting used for tourists. Alika works in the tourist industry, though the land his family has lived on for years will be sold to make way for a new hotel. Michael mostly lives at a small bay to Malama, that area, as generations of his family have done. George has killed himself under the crushing responsibility of a failed business and a troubled relationship. While there are characters who are not Hawaiian, a local Japanese school teacher, common trope, a tourist cop couple, the hollow wife of the deceased brother. They are mostly, though not always, 
seen in opposition to the Hawaiian characters. The men's relationship with the Aina is central to much of the conflict, though it is also seen as a nurturing source of joy. There's a lot of code switching between pidgin and standard English, as well as a casual use of Alelo Hawaii. By the end of the play, their disconnection from the land, whether by arrest or eviction or death, implies that these Hawaiians may no longer have a place in their own country. Victoria Milani Nibel's The Conversion of Ka'ahumanu, set in 1820 at the arrival of the first congregational missionaries from the US, explicitly possession, positions Nakanaka Maoli as the indigenous inhabitants of the island. Here, the Western monarchy has not yet been, the Hawaiian monarchy, pardon, has not yet been overthrown, nor have constitutions based on Western values subverted Hawaiian political and cultural life. The characters are all women. Queen Ka'ahumanu, the queen regent, two young Hawaiian women whose choices bend their story arcs in radically different directions, and two Haole women, based on two of those who were part of the first contingent of missionaries. The Haole women are the foreigners, the other in this play. They're the first white women the Hawaiians have ever seen, and the Hawaiian characters initially view the two Haole as exotic and peculiar specimens. The Howe women themselves are almost painfully aware of their alien status and hold to their Christian mission as a way of easing the pain of isolation from their homes. Queen Ka'ahumanu's kuleana, her responsibility, is to guide her people, and she does take bold and decisive steps. Her search is for hanapono, the right thing to do. But we're also reminded in this play that her path was fraught with obstacles and complications arising from the foreign presence. One of the aspects I find most interesting, or very interesting, about this play is the use of language. The play uses the convention of having all the characters speak in standard English, regardless of which language they're actually speaking. No one speaks pidgin, since that language evolved later within the plantation environments. And clearly, the Hawaiian and Haole are eloquent in their own languages. But when the characters are speaking the newly learned languages, either Hawaiian or English, they use a much simplified syntax and a very limited vocabulary. As they struggle to comprehend each other, language is the fragile and awkward bridge that determines their relationship. Do please watch the Pacific Islander plays offered during this conference. See what the playwrights are saying about themselves and their lived experience. See if you can discern how the performers manifest the authenticity that resides in their bones. As for local plays, well, I suspect that the second group of 10-minute plays, the Pico, may contain some local plays. But otherwise, you're not going to get that here, not this time. I get that to a casual observer, it may seem that all the peoples currently residing here have blended, as the boundaries can be understated. I wonder sometimes, though, whether this ostensible, ostensible merging of indigenous and settler populations is somehow a possible explanation for the continent's easy embrace of APA, API, AAPI, Asian Americans may feel that they're looking in a mirror when they look at Hawaii's population. So much black hair, so many tanned faces, so many people who could be their relatives. But it's not a mirror image. I spoke earlier about local theater reflect, reflecting the local social imaginary. It's not reflecting Asian America. That miscon misconception, that misconstruction, is clearly shared by the dominant culture. Witness the Asian Americanization of Hawaii Five O and other mainstream TV and film that supplant images of Pacific Islanders and locals by casting Asian Americans. AAPI, 
almost every single article or headline using that term turns out to be about Asian American topics or individuals. I recently read a San Francisco Chronicle t article entitled, CineQuest 2024, Michael Paul Chan reflects on the evolution of AAPI representation on screen. Chan's not responsible for that title, but there's no mention of Pacific Islanders in the article. And Lilo and Stitch is included in Jeff Yang's book, The Golden Screen, the movies that made Asian America. Pacific Islanders don't even make it into that title. This treatment's not new. The Conversion of Kaahumanu was published in Valina Hasu Houston's 1997 anthology, but still like air, I'll rise, new American plays. It was a groundbreaking anthology and the introduction does have a bit about Nubel and her play, but it's a Hawaiian play. And to be included as an American play, well, that's a discussion. A questionnaire I got from Kata before the conference asked, how can Asian American theaters and the field in general better support Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander artists? Um, other than, well, in addition to noting that local's not mentioned, I'm interested in how support will be defined. Does Asian American theater lead, bringing Pacific Islander and local theater along behind, offering the occasional spotlight? Do you any, any of you remember when major f funders were offering significant financial support for regional theaters to grow their audiences of color? How effective was that? How long did it last? Or does um, Asian American theater offer a parallel visibility to Pacific Islander and local theater? I mean, the initials are there too, after all. But there's a third notion. If I say, I got your back, you're in the vanguard. You're out in front, not me. Alliances are always possible. Hawaiian and local, Asian American and Hawaiian, local and Asian American. And there are probably really interesting possibilities. But theater of Hawaii, Hawaiian and local, expresses the identity of Hawaii's people from their varied perspectives. From a solely demographic standpoint, these identities might be relatively incidental to you, singular and quaint, but by virtue of their lesser numbers and visibility, peripheral and tangential. The nuances of Hawaiian and local identity may seem nominal, but to Hawaiian and local theater practitioners and advocates, they are not. Don't Asian American theater artists claim agency for themselves, demand visibility and parity, regardless of how the dominant culture views them? So might Pacific Islanders and local theater artists. Don't punch down. What I think is, don't give up on this. Relationships are possible. Alliances can be worth pursuing. Alliances should lift up all partners. But alliances should be uneasy, alert enough to recognize change, and committed to supporting the volition and autonomy of all parties. Tedani comes on me, dog. Domo arigato gozaimasu. Mahalo me lo, make a ha a ha as much as I can manage. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> I 
I told you all she was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> now, what we're going to have at this moment is we're going to be able to expand on this conversation with two um, uh, more guests who are going to be a part of this plenary. So as we set up chairs, yeah, we'll be moving into uh, an additional conversation with Sammy and two more guests. And if their bios appear up here, then I'm not going to read their bios. <laughs> I'm just going to share a little something. Oh, their bios aren't there. OK, so I will read the bios, but I'll also share a little something. Um, these two individuals that are going to come up and join Sammy have collaborated. They've all kind of collaborated um, with each other in some way, some form. Um, or, yeah, their paths have crossed. and and. I have been very fortunate to have awesome working relationships, creative relationships with these individuals who um, are those individuals that really understand the, the complexities of what was being shared just minutes ago by Sammy. Um, so let me just go ahead and call them all out when they're ready. Um, Dr. Craig Howes uh, is the director of the Center for Biographical Research. Um, he's the co-editor of Biography, an interdisciplinary quarterly, and a professor of English at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He has been involved. Oh, yeah, we can we can pai pai lima. That's all good. He's been involved in the Hawaii theater scene for 40 years. His highlights include 10 years on the board of Kumukahua Theater, appearing in premieres of two of Victoria Nalani Nubo's plays, Ola Naivi and The Holiday of Rain, and regularly performing in living history productions, focusing on Hawaii's political and cultural legacies at Iolani Palace, the Kamehameha, the Kamehameha V Judiciary History Center, and the Maui Arts and Cultural Center, as well as Foster Botanical Gardens. Craig is also a mentor of mine in this academic sea that we travel through <laughs> here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, every time that something comes up that I'm like, hmm, how does this really work? I turn to Craig, because this institution can be tricky to navigate at times. <laughs> so I just send my mahalo ya oai e Craig no ko kako mau i ke ia kaik mahine no kapa'a a me um, ko kako o mau i kapapahana Hawaii a me kapapahana o ano. Craig is also a founding member of our Research Institute of Indigenous Knowledge, Ahahui Noi no Eau Oivi. Um, mahalo ya oai. Mahalo. <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring out Kiki Rivera. Kiki is an internationally produced <laughs> theater artist, educator, and arts activist. They hold a bachelor's degree in theater and an MFA in playwriting from here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I was very thrilled to be able to mentor Kiki through that process as their advisor in their quest for an MFA in playwriting and all of those early works that have now turned into produced, published works that really represent a particular identity and intersectionality that calls all of what we were talking about, right? The different identities here in Hawaii Local, not local, yeah? Hawaiian, not Hawaiian, right? All of these kinds of questions, as well as um, queer identity. Um, Kiki's voice is a leading voice in, in that arena. And um, yeah, mahalo a nui ya oi, ko noho ana mai ke yala. Mahalo, mahalo. A couple more things. Uh, their original plays include Fa'alave Lave, The Interruption, which was actually Kiki's MFA thesis that opened uh, in 2017. 
in the lab theater where our 10 minute plays are happening as well as the love of spam and that was that particular play was the first ever Samoan play in this building in in this institution <laughs> um, other plays include um, Pussy, uh, which opened at Kumukahua Theatre, as well as was performed in New Zealand um, as a one act with um, playwright uh, Victor Rogers' Black Faggot. So those two were paired together. Uh, and they, uh, that piece also appears in the anthology Samoan Queer Lives. Um, and then Two Are Black and Brown Babies of Ocean and Islands is featured in an anthology, We're Not Neutral, and Kumuku Kui in Lightning, Lighting the Way, an anthology of short plays about the climate crisis. I'm going to welcome back Sammy to join these two. Yes. Oh. We need the mic. We need the mic. I think we have two. Yeah, that one. Here's one. And this will be two. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Ah, ah, oh yeah. Mahalo. Mahalo. So please give them a round of applause. So Mahalo for staying for this talk. Um, so uh, I was offered a, uh, a panel discussion with a moderator and questions, and I, I suppose us, the three of us, or whomever, sitting behind tables, which did not feel very local to me. So I thought, you know, if we could be in, <laughs> in back of somebody's house <laughs> or in the carport, you know, with the, the beer refrigerator there. That would be really nice. This is as close as we can get. So. We need a cooler. Yeah. I want to get closer. Yeah. yeah. Good idea. Good idea. So these are two people with whom I've worked on various projects for years. Um, in, in Heidi's generous introduction, she said that I'd worked with Vicki Newell on her Living History Plays. And both Kiki and Craig have performed in those, not just the ones about Hawaiian history, but um, about, oh God, it, it is about Hawaiian history. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I value both of them very much. They both have extremely different experiences of theater in Hawaii. So I, to start off, Oh. Theater in Hawaii, for you, what's been your experience? Theater in Hawaii. Um, I think there are multiple, you know, like, like you said, there are all these different um, groups of theater in Hawaii and what that means. Um, I would like to think that I, I am part of both. I started off in local theater and then um, eventually went into Hawaiian theater and Pacifica theater um, because Pacifica theater was just still not uh, part of the general theater scene mm -hmm. in Hawaii. Um, I love to be part of the stories that uh, aren't popular um, and part of the reason why I started all of this was because I started on this stage and did all these roles, and all those roles didn't reflect my life experience, um, which made me want to see more stories about me and connect to stories that I could relate to. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I can say a lot more about theater in Hawaii. That's a loaded question. <laughs> I'm just going to pass the mic. 
Okay, well, uh, like another Hawley, uh, Liam Neeson, uh, as far as Hawaii uh, theater is concerned, I have a specific set of skills. I have played every bad Hawley who has ever existed in any local or Hawaiian play. I've and he's played also played, he's also played good Hawley. I have, I have. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring that up. <laughs> there were two. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I have played every single person who was responsible for the overthrow of the Kingdom of Hawaii. Uh, <laughs> I have played FBI agents, I have played plantation owners, I have played... Uh, so yes, a particular set of skills. Um, <clears throat> but what I'd emphasize more than anything else uh, in terms of my experience of, of theater in Hawaii has been actually the diversity of venues or media in which people end up representing the lives of people of Hawaii and of the Pacific. Um, because theater tends to make us suggest a particular kind of venue and location, a kind of black box, whether it's this big or whatever. But um, the range of ways that this place represents itself to itself in terms of performance is really quite remarkable. Um, I've worked with uh, both uh, Sammy and, and Kiki in very site-specific uh, theater and living history, uh, staging material on the overthrow, for example, on the location where it took place, or uh, the trial of Queen Lili or Kalani in the Supreme Court building. So that notion of trying to locate place in relation to representation and performance is one dimension. Uh, I work with Sammy in doing the history of Foster Botanical Gardens, which goes back to the 1850s in the gardens. Um, we also see the same kind of thing in terms of uh, educational theater, uh, Honolulu Theater for Youth, that continual, relentless representation of different kinds of experience and community. Um, for a particular audience, but continually moving through all of the islands. Um, radio. Uh, I, Sammy and I were lucky enough to co-produce a show called Aloha Shorts, which was Hawaii's literature, Hawaii's music, and Hawaii's actors featured weekly on a half-hour show on Hawaii Public Radio. That ran for four years. We did 104 shows. So that one of the things you will see is a kind of perpetual reinforcement in a variety of media. And people who act and direct and write and perform in Hawaii tend to be very versatile. And in fact, the media frequently are every bit as sort of diverse and often contested as the population itself. So I'll just stop there and pass it over to Sammy and we'll see where we go. <laughs> I want to add to that because um, a theater in Hawaii has opened my eyes up to that other layer. There's, there's what we know of Hawaii, you know, the, the narratives that we're told, uh, the narratives that we live, and then there are opportunities. It's given me an opportunity to see Hawaii through a lot of different mm. eyes, through local eyes, through, um, I mean, I guess I am Asian too, so. Through, <laughs> 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 But yeah, no, it's just through those eyes, and it's helped me being part of my poena mm -hmm. on, on the grounds of the palace has helped me see Hawaii through those eyes, and maybe I've just played that role so many times that I feel like I've lived that mm -hmm. reality. And so when you constantly are telling these stories that aren't usually heard, uh, you have an chance to just see it's it's almost like living in two worlds there's the physical world and there's a spiritual world mm -hmm. that theater in Hawaii has opened me up to I will second that also um, the 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 role in the scene that Kiki's referring to actually Craig and Kiki were in that same scene and it play, takes place on the day good Howley good Howley who's a good Howley in that one yeah um, um, it takes place on the day that the American um, Marines marched down King Street in order to protect Hawaii, uh, American lives and property. 
but were actually there as a threat to the queen. So they would be standing at the coronation stand on Il Iloni Palace ground, and Kiki's pointing to King Street. That's actually where they were. So, and I, and I also would second Kiki's statement about learning from doing the plays, learning from doing the research in order to do the plays. Um, I was telling Kiki earlier this morning that I'm not local. My parents were born here, Wahewa and Moloka'i, but I didn't spend the right formative years here to have that gut level, that now level of connection to Hawaii. I know a lot of stuff, but I'm not local. And I'm not Asian American. Although I did spend all that time in San Francisco with uh, hanging out with the Asian American Theater Center folks. That was in the 90s, a long time ago. Um, I learned about being Asian American there. I had never known that before. I'd never realized any of, any of that experience before. And it really opened my eyes. And I used to say, oh, I learned how to be Asian American when I lived in San Francisco. I kind of still agree with that, but I don't think I can actually be Asian American. That's not me. So, yeah, doing all these plays in Hawaii and, and being forced to understand what I was directing has just opened my eyes, too. I learned how to be Asian American. I learned how to be someone through, <laughs> through plays, through someone writers. Uh, I also wanted to say that I didn't know what AAPI meant or stood for until I moved to the continent uh, four years ago. And you know, when Sammy is talking about AAPI and well, what does that mean, that's not something that we have to think about being here because we just are local in Hawaii and we have other things to think about, survival one, and how to survive on this island. Um, but yeah, those acronyms almost don't pertain to us. So when I first moved there and I was asked to do um, social media stuff and plan for the month of May for uh, what did she say? She called, my boss called it something, but she was saying the acronym. Maybe it was a a API uh, Heritage Month. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, all right, I'll do that. And then after my call, I go, what does that mean? <laughs> what, is, what is AAPI? <laughs> what does that stand for? <laughs> so I had to look it up. And I thought, oh, wow, this is interesting. The things they do on the continent is very different <laughs> from yeah. how we operate on the island. Um, yeah, so that's just been my last four years, is learning what that means and how uh, we as Pacific Islanders operate in the diaspora on the, on the continent. But yeah, very different lived experiences. And lived exper Asian American lived experiences are so different from being Asian in Hawaii. And I think, you know, I want to say that part of identifying as Asian American is to recognize the American part. And if you're, if we're really, if we're, if we're being real, <laughs> and recognizing the history of Hawaii, we're not American. <laughs> so how can, we, how can we even fathom the idea of, of being Asian American? Because, yeah. It's I, I, would, I would point out that, um, yeah, not being American, but there are the trappings of America. I remember Seth, your son, in high school. How many years did he have that Mohawk? I mean, that was, that was amazing. 
We get the influences from the continent. Yeah. Uh, a couple, and that was the, uh, yeah. <laughs> he was, um, yeah, he, he went to Kalani High School here. That will mean something to a few of you. And uh, yeah, see? And, um, and he ended up, he was basically the only punk. You would see him striding down Kalani on the Highway with a blonde mohawk and black leather jacket and Doc Martens. And, um, I thought this was odd. He is now a professor of German studies at the University of Missouri uh, <laughs> and took German, wrote his doctoral dissertation on East German punk before the Venda and was always introduced when he was there as Das Punk aus Hawaii. There are many different ways of being from Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> but that's one of the points I wanted to make um, because you know, it's that, to quote my background, that William Wordsworth notion of we sometimes murder to dissect, um, that in addition, looking at the theater in Hawaii over the last 40 years, there's a lot of fooling around. Uh, there's a lot of wild diversity. There's a lot of exploration on the part of profoundly imaginative directors and writers and so on and so forth. I mean, the last play that Kiki and I were in, they were playing a transcendent, multi-century angel who periodically visited Earth, this time in the guise of the owner of a Samoan bed and breakfast, being followed by me, who was playing Aleister Crowley, who was a Satanist from the early 20th century, trying to reignite our passionate, transcendent love relationship, which they wanted nothing to do with which it seems to me is the essence of Pacific Island theater. <laughs> <laughs> and this was by Vicki Nubel, a auditory, and Alani But, um, yeah, I think one of the things that does happen, though, and diversity is, of course, an overused and contentious term, but if you actually look at the range of what has been produced in terms of Hawaii theater, whether the inflection is Asian American or Kanaka Maoli or Pacific Island or whatever, is you'll see a tremendous amount of innovation, experimentation, um, drawing in of various kinds of technology. But as Sammy, I think, put across so well, that perpetual negotiation through all of the tools of theater of what in fact identity means here, who people are, what you have to accept, what you have to not accept, uh, what you have to recognize in terms of the conflicts and the tensions that individuals are dealing with. And it seems to me that's one of the things that theater, regardless of where you are, is dealing with in one way or another. It's just here, it's, it's heightened because it's a small place and the ways that people got here was, it's, it's a, a remarkable and a sad and also a, um, an inspiring history. Okay, so I have questions in case none of us can think of anything to say. But um, I do want to talk a little bit about the Massey case because it's been dramatized several times. Uh, there's been a movie about it. What was it called? Blood Orchid, I think. That was like back in the 80s. Um, but Dennis Carroll compiled a play um, called Massey Kaha Hawaii. From, mainly from primary sources, I believe. Yeah, from primary sources. It was produced at Kumukuhua, finally, after one of the primary figures died, Thalia, Thalia Massey's husband, after he died. And the production and then the humanities discussion event that was held afterwards were galvanizing. They were amazing. We had audiences of younger people who actually had not known that story, but were coming to understand its impact on Hawaii's history and culture. But then we also had older people who remembered the story. We had somebody whose grandfather had been in the jury, and we actually held the discussion, the humanities event, in a 1930s courthouse at Ali'i Hale. 
This is a building, this is the building where uh, the King Kamehameha statue is. And Joseph Kahavai was kidnapped in front of that building. Yeah, when people walked out that night, they walked basically out the door that Kahavai walked out of and into the car into his death. Yeah. Um, and the, we were in the courtroom uh, where, oh, there'd been a configuration. We were in the historic courtroom where this had taken place. And the descendants of the people who had been on the jury were sitting in the jury box. So it wasn't that long ago. Um, the missionaries came in 1820. In the whole you know, the scale of things, that's not that long ago. But the massive changes that the people of Hawaii have caused, have endured, have coped with, um, all contribute to what people put in their theater here. And if you don't take the time to understand that and know where that history is coming from and know why a certain character is behaving the way they do, why the events are slanted this way, then you skate over the surface. And that does the work no justice, and it does the people no justice either. I would say that about any Asian American play too. You go see Cambodian rock band, yeah, it's great, but you know, if I can delve into the history, look at what happened in Cambodia. Because when you look into the past, you see, you see those strands coming down and affecting who people are today and why they do what they do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> I was so caught in what you were saying, and I was also formulating thoughts, and then now I don't remember. But um, yeah, the importance of really hearing each other's story. We have to, we hear it, right, when, when we watch Cambodian rock band or Viet Gone. Um, but I don't think a lot of people hear or even see what local theater is and what those stories are from uh, what the local Asian experience mm -hmm. is um, from here. And you know, there's probably a lot of reasons for that. We're so far away from the rest of the continent. But, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? You know, like, give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> Let me sip my coffee. <laughs> coffee or water, you got a choice yeah. there. Um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is there's also a, a strong tradition here of drawing on artists in parallel medias for the resources of theater. So, for example, a really prominent strain in Kumukohua Theater was drawing off Asian American literature as it was appearing at the time. So some of the most uh, successful productions have not only been of work by Lois Ann Yamanaka uh, from her novels or uh, Zach Lindmark or um, uh, Gary Pak um, or uh, Nora Okja Keller. So in fact, it often works out that the inspiration for performance in theater comes from that extensive and equally uh, conflicted but productive tradition of Asian American literature as well. Uh, but to show you the weird proximities, Maxine Hong Kingston wrote Woman Warrior and China Man about a mile away from where Joseph Kahavai was killed, all up in the back of this valley. Okay, now I remember what I was going to say. This is when I was going to talk about the importance of Pilina. Um, and, you know, one, one of the things you were talking about is how, how do we support each other? How do you, now that you're here in Hawaii, how do you go out and support, support theater in Hawaii? Um, and I, it starts with, with Pilina and the, the, the relationships that are built. And it starts here in this space between us. And, it, and that's what we, growing up in Hawaii, that's one of the the things that we have at our, at, we're grown, we're developed with Hawaiian values. 
which guides a lot of our practice without even thinking about thinking twice about it uh, and when we talk about support I think we also have to talk about relationship building and what that looks like and how do we envision uh, the relationships that start here into the future and I think Kata has um, already started that just by what uh, the conference that they had how many years ago was that already in Chicago that you know that was why we're here now it was that the, the Pilina between them established at that time um, so yeah I think that's something that I've been thinking about is how how do we show up for each other if we are building relationships that is a hard one that's a really hard one um, certainly recognition in the in a conference venue in the academic world that's helpful um, Ed Sakamoto's plays have been performed on the continent. I think Vicky's plays occasionally. Lee Catalina is, is getting commissions. I recently saw a reading of a play called Emilani that was commissioned by the, damn it. Arena, Arena thank you, yeah. mahalo. Yeah, so work originating in Hawaii is is sort of getting out there. I mean, we are a very marginal state. People don't think of us as part of the US anyway. You know, it's, we're out there. Um, a lot of the image is, one thing I liked about Emilani was that it was presenting the Ali'i as real people as people who were vitally interested, not only in their own lives, but in their country. And it wasn't a noble play. Do you know the noble savage? It wasn't the noble Hawaiian. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I appreciated that. Um, I don't know how, how well plays in pigeon translate. I know um, Folks You Million Longs has been performed elsewhere around the continent. And God, it's funny. It's really funny. But sometimes I think that for people who are not from Hawaii, and even for people here, pigeon is code for comedy. And I wish so much that you had the opportunity to see Aleni Apio's Come Out trilogy. Because, yeah, there's comedy in it from the pigeon speaking characters, but oh my God, there's tragedy. And they're just living their lives speaking pigeon. That's, that's, their, that's normal. They code switch when they need to. And I wish that that portrayal was out there as well rather than, you know. They're speaking pigeon, ha ha ha. Yeah. I just happened to be teaching that just in the last few weeks, and one of the things my students noticed most was that there was, what Lee Catalina does is she acknowledges that the pigeon is immediately gonna get laughs, and we saw this with Aloha Shorts all the time with our live audience. But if you look at a lot of her monologues, what happens is she sets that up at the beginning people laugh because they're hearing pigeon terms or whatever, but as the monologue develops, it suddenly starts getting serious, and it suddenly starts getting nuanced, and you realize you're dealing with really painful circumstances. So by the end, you have a kind of deathly silence, although if you listen to the first minutes, you would have thought it was a laugh riot. Right, there's that one monologue about a, a guy, he's sitting in longs, maybe waiting for the pharmacy or something, and he sees his niece and he says, oh, baby, hi, not seeing you for so long. Come, come. And, you know, it's, it's really sweet. And then he starts asking her to sit on his lap. And, okay, not, not there, move over a little bit. Move. That's the deathly silence. And it's all in pigeon. 
Pigeon is remarkably flexible. And I wish, I wish that were better known. I'd just like to pick up on that notion of Polina, because that's a term that has actually become really, really strong here, and basically means degree of connection and what kind of connection. But one of the things I like to mention, and Haley Osorio, Jamaica Osorio, is in some ways one of the major people writing about this, but one of the things she points out about Polina is that we have to examine what are supposedly the important connections and undermine that. She's dealing with issues of um, heteronormativity, she's dealing with um, issues of uh, uh, monogamous relationships. And one of the things she's pointing about in Polina in terms of how we connect with people is that they move into prominence and out of prominence at various times. That in certain places that we are or certain moments in our lives, the relations that are most important to us are not necessarily the relations that are being insisted upon as being the primary or the focused relationships. So if you're on a travel, it might work out the person that you meet along the way to get you over the next 500 yards is the most important Polina you have and that you can be grateful for it and value and have great aloha for it. But when you get to the other side of the valley, it fades as you pick up the next connection. I found that really helpful to think about the way that we actually work collaboratively. Oh god, that's good. Yeah. 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 So, um, <laughs> so I, I wonder um, if we can take any questions. Yes. So if you could bring up the house a bit. Hi. <laughs> Are there any questions or comments? Anything? You can disagree. You can criticize. That's fine, too. <laughs> With what, babe? With what? Surprise is good. Even at my age, it's really nice to still be surprised. Exactly, yeah. Thank you for all the comments. I really learned a lot from everyone's um, participation. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the local, because when you were speaking, local was juxtaposed really against US nation state. And I wonder, you know, a, a lot of us now think about relation to Asia and also relation sort of inter-Pacific as, as kind of shaping a lot of what happens in places like Hawaii. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit more about that and what, how you think the local functions in relation to either Asia or to, like, for example, Hawaii v. Samoa or whatever. OK. I think one of the ways that local has shifted here is in reaction to Asia. And that has a lot to do with Japanese investment in property. Um, it, it, I think even I, one of the, the labels I listed was local Japanese. and. I've, I've heard that used actually a fair amount to distinguish from the local people who descended from Japanese immigrants with the Japanese who are coming over and buying up property here. So, so there's a lot of tension there. 
there's um, there's a stereotype of Koreans coming over and working in bars, whether as owners or bar girls. Okay, um, there, yeah, there's a lot of tension, and it makes I think local contract a little bit. Yeah, there's a whole other dimension to the notion of local, which many of you would be familiar with, in that a particular union configuration is referred to as a local. That has an awful lot to do with the term local here, because the attempt, as Sammy was pointing out, the attempt of the plantation owners to keep ethnic groups segregated on the plantations and try and fix them into, I mean, given the early history of the 20th century, Koreans did not have a great deal of aloha for Japanese. Uh, or Chinese. So the idea was to keep these groups separated, largely to keep them from organizing. All right? So that when you started getting the major movement toward unionizing, one of the major commitments of the union organizers was, we can't emphasize these ethnic distinctions. So the motto became, brothers under the skin. And in fact, they let various unions that were ethnic specific, like Filipino unions, they let them hang because they were still maintaining an ethnic distinction. So you, ha you look at the Massey Kahavai case, where basically from the American newspapers, everybody who was not white in Hawaii was Hawaiian and savage. All right. So that notion of local as, all right, this is how we're all getting represented in the New York Times. Uh, so we've got to recognize this is an identity that, that we have as local. But then on top of that, there was the notion of, and we also have to bring ourselves together to deal with the economic oligarchy. So local also tended to mean the group of people who are going to be primarily associated not just with the 442nd, but also with the entire labor movement, which is the largest thing that in some ways creates the new Hawaii. There's some remarkable work being done at the moment about the issue of the resilience and the persistence of ethnic identity within the unions, particularly among Kanaka Maoli volunteers. There's uh, actually the education specialist for uh, the ILWU local here, uh, Ili Malong, is doing a PhD in indigenous politics specifically about how ethnic identity is retained within that global notion of the political local. So local also has a kind of economic and political dimension to it, which was actually really focused and directed toward labor action. I, I have one more thing to add. Um, I would say that the military, thank you. I'd say that the military presence, which is very strong here, um, has something to do with it because we are aware that we are potentially a target. Um, we have nuclear submarines at Pearl Harbor. We're potentially a target of other countries. Um, there are military games constantly being played here. Um, Native Hawaiian land is unusable because it's been used there's an exposed ordinance all over the place on, the, on those lands. So um, if you get really, really depressed about it, you can feel that Hawaii is under siege. <clears throat> now, daily life, you know, you go along with your quotidian self, <laughs> and that's it. But the reality is that, yeah, there are those pressures from outside. And they're felt, subliminally or not. Other? Oh, aloha. Hello, hi. My name is Eliza. Thank you so much um, for this talk. So um, thank you, Sammy, Kiki, and Craig. Um, yeah, so my name hop on. Uh, my name is Eliza, and my question for you all is about local culture and um, immigrants. So I want to I wanna ask you all about local culture because we're talking a lot about inclusivity. Um, and I want to hear your thoughts on um, maybe the shortcomings of local culture. And I'm talking as someone who was born and raised in Kalihi, and I'm a Filipina. So I know that in local culture and local comedy, um, Filipinos have always been the butt of the joke yeah. here in Hawaii. And I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Filipinos have a, a really fraught history in terms of immigration. Um, 
part of it is that for a long time, because of U.S. immigration laws, only men were allowed to come. So you have these Filipino men who were then portrayed, my grandmother told me this, living on a plantation, you were careful about Filipino men. If you were a young girl, you did not go, go around them because you wouldn't know what they were going to do to you. Um, yeah, that, that's a really strong theme in Hawaiian plantation history. Regarding recent immigration, though, I think there is, uh, you know, putting up the barricades. You have, my, my father's side is Korean, so we have all these upper middle class professional people in that, in that family, and they make a distinction between that wave of Im Korean immigrants and the new wave of Korean immigrants. It's like there's less commonality between those two waves than amongst their local friends. So yeah, there was a lot of prejudice. And they re you really have to figure out what, what they're dealing with. I mean, what do you, why if I'm half Korean, do I not have anything in common with somebody who's just come off, come off the plane? from Seoul. I, and it's because of the identity that has been built here. That's so much in me, and it's, it's foreign there. I, I lived in Korea for a while, a couple of years, and um, I, was, I was always marked out as a foreigner, and part of that was because of how I walk. I, you know, the really simple things. I am not Korean. But I am. <laughs> I was just having a conversation about this with another um, local Philippine, Filipina. Uh, yeah, just the dangers of that one family history. Uh, I am a product of that, uh, what you were talking about with the Filipino men mm -hmm. and how they're single and to beware. That's my, my grandfather, and that's how my grandmother ended up marrying him, um, because she was much younger, and um, they met on the plantation because my great-grandmother was, um, she would do their laundry, and she was also a gambler, so that's how uh, they were in that same space. Anyway, so there's that that I wanted to say and I remember when I was growing up and my mom this really stood out to me when I asked my mom what ethnicities what, what is what are, how do you identify like what are your what's your nationality and she said oh I'm an American and there was this uh, the idea of being an American and not and disowning your mm -hmm. Filipino identity, right? That happens with um, with that plantation culture and with being local. And uh, I think the danger, one of the harmful um, things about identifying as local and the, the the belonging of being local is, and this is something a lot of people will probably disagree with, but local as, as American, of that, as that disowning mm. the cultural heritage to be local feels to me very American and very much a part of that, that tool, uh, that settler colonial uh, tool. And just to add on that, it's those contradictions like local Howley, um, the other thing that's going on there, if people talk here about local humor, they're almost always referring to ethnic humor and also ethnic humor which is reinforcing certain kinds of stereotypes which in fact are not equal or equally valued, uh, which is a whole other dimension of this. Um, we haven't 
uh, Sammy brought it up a bit, but the whole issue of Asian settler colonialism as a, as a concept is developed by people like Candace Fujikani and Jonathan Okamura and a, a whole generation of scholars now is based on the notion that some of those kind of globalizing notions actually are reinforcing specific distinctions. So that, for instance, right now when we talk about immigration, the two largest immigrating groups into Hawaii at the moment are people from the Pacific Islands, Micronesia, Wuhan, and various other places who are leaving because they literally cannot live where they grew up. Uh, climate change and whatever is actually making it impossible to do so. So we've got people coming in from there, and the other group that comes in are the wealthiest people on Earth. So what we've got is a situation where one group of immigrants are buying $5 million condos and the other ones are trying to find a way of not having to sleep in the streets. And much of the law is trying to make sure that that first group of immigrants never has to see the second group of immigrants. Okay? Okay. So um, I just wanted to point out that notion of local has that same kind of spectrum in terms of negative and positive uh, connotations, just more generally. And theater represents all that. Hi. So, oh, um, sorry. Actually, I've been given the, yeah, we're over time. Um, but mahalo on me for your warm welcome and your willingness to listen and to engage in conversations. Um, have a great rest of the day and rest of the conference. Aloha. Thank you.